Welcome everyone, I'm Liz Fernandez with Professional People Training. Our speaker today is Dr. Richard French. Dr. French is a veterinary pathologist serving animal health needs globally. He recently served in China as the head of the Health Management Center for Bowringer Ingelheim, Shanghai PRC. Previously, he was the Vice President of Animal Health, Diagnostic Services, China area for the CP Group. He presently serves on the advisory board for a large multinational agribusiness and serves in scientific advisory capacity for the FAO OIE Joint Committee on ASF in Asia. The former Dean of the School of Animal Studies and Allerton Chair of Animal Health Science, Becker College, Dr. French acquired his DVM from the University of Illinois. He went into small animal practice for several years and then returned to academics receiving a master's in parasitology and a PhD in neuropathology and completed a residency in anatomic pathology. Dr. French then served as a tenured faculty member at the University of Connecticut and as a pathologist in the Connecticut Veterinary Medical Diagnostic Lab. Dr. French later served as the director of the New Hampshire Veterinary Diagnostic Lab. Dr. French is a member of the USDA National Animal Health Emergency Response Corps and has served in national and international disease outbreaks. Dr. French's primary interests are in emerging zoonotic and transboundary diseases of animal and public health significance. He has numerous publications and broad fields, which includes the first report of West Nile virus in the Northern Hemisphere. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. French. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, what we wanted to cover today uh, is lumpy skin disease. As many of you are aware, uh, this is a disease that is on the move uh, in Asia. And starting out here, of course, with Capri pox virus, uh, this is the genera or the group that lumpy skin disease falls within. But we'll move right into this presentation. So one of the things that we want to do in this review of lumpy skin disease is talk about all the critical points, the definition, etiology, host range, transmission, uh, clinical and gross lesions, morbidity, mortality, where the disease is now and what we would need to know for diagnosis of the disease. And of course here, we're talking about Capri pox viruses and specifically lumpy skin disease. So as many of you are aware, there are pox viruses in most of the vertebrates uh, in the world. Uh, you should be familiar the Tropoc viruses, mainly because of their zoonotic potential. Uh, for example, monkeypox and camelpox, uh, which have been in the news recently. And then we have the parapox viruses, our uh, ORF within sheep and contagious pustular dermatitis that we do see in cattle, as well as bovine papillary stomatitis. Uh, and then the Capri pox viruses, again, this is where we are focused is specifically on lumpy skin disease. Now, lumpy skin disease uh, goes by different names uh, throughout the world, so it depends on where you are in the world. In Asia, they're calling it a nodular skin disease as opposed to lumpy skin disease. But you'll see the name pseudo-acaria, uh, urticaria, uh, netling virus disease. The netling virus is awfully, oftentimes the benchmark for the genomic sequencing. Uh, exanthema, uh, nodularis bulbus, uh, which would make sense. And then not felt seek, uh, which is uh, another name that you will see used for this disease, depending on where it's occurring in the world. Cross is the genus Capri virus, Capri pox virus and these are within the family Poxviridae. Uh, and of interest, there's only one serotype, so serologic will not differentiate between sheep and goat pox or lumpy skin disease uh, in areas where these diseases are occurring. The very large uh, virus, pox viruses, are one of the largest viruses that we know. It's a double-stranded DNA virus. It's enveloped. That's important to know because envelope viruses can be uh, inactivated with common detergents, soaps. Uh, so it's important to know the structure of the virus. And then of course it has a membrane, a lipoprotein bilayer. It has these two unique lateral bodies, which makes it easy to pick up on electron microscopy, which is actually a rapid diagnostic tool for 
lumpy skin disease as well as other pox viruses, and then you have your nucleoprotein core. So there are a number of lumpy skin disease or Caffrey pox viruses that have been uh, sequenced and identified throughout the world, and this includes our sheep pox viruses, our goat pox viruses, and then our lumpy skin disease viruses. And this is not a complete map, uh, phenotypic map of all viral isolates. Uh, but what is important to note here is that typically these viruses have a narrow host range. And so what that means is any one isolate must be identified as a problem in a specific breed of cattle. Uh, and what we do know is that uh, for most of the treatments for the pox viruses, they use attenuated uh, live vaccine strains. Uh, and these attenuated vaccines in one breed may cause fulminant disease in another breed. Just to give you an example, at uh, uh, when we're working with sheep pox virus, we typically will try to get merino sheep because merino sheep will have the most uh, remarkable clinical presentation of sheep pox virus with the strain that we have. If we bring in Suffolk sheep and use that exact same virus, sometimes we uh, will have uh, subclinical disease in those sheep. So it really depends on the virus and the host, and also the age of the host. So this is an important feature. Uh, so the treatment for this disease in the world uh, where it's occurring uh, is attenuated live vaccine strains. Uh, and they can be a problem in causing disease if they get into other breeds. By definition, it's from the Gray Book. Uh, if some of you remember the Gray Book, uh, lumpy skin disease is an acute to chronic viral disease of cattle characterized by skin nodules that may have inverted conical necrosis, or what is called a sit fast, with lymphadenitis accompanied by a persistent fever. In terms of the stability of the virus, um, it's actually you've been, uh, you're well aware now of African swine fever. You could actually uh, associate this with the same conditions that African swine fever uh, survives. Um, it's interesting to note that African swine fever in its early discovery was actually believed to be a pox virus. Um, because of its size and its uh, double-stranded DNA content. But here we're looking at the stability of the pox viruses. Basically, they're susceptible to heat, so they're inactivated above certain temperatures. They're, of course, susceptible to sunlight. They're inactivated uh, below a pH of 4 and above 10, which is actually a quite, quite a right, wide range, pH range, where the virus can survive. They're susceptible to detergents, and we've talked about this already because they have that uh, uh, lipid bilayer around the nuclear core. So typical uh, solvents will work against this, most disinfectants that would be used on farms and other premises. Um, but it can also survive for many years under the right conditions. So dried scabs at ambient temperature in a in an environment such as you see in this uh, in the springtime, where you have lower temperatures, uh, uh, higher water content, you know, rainy season, the springtime uh, weather that you would normally expect across uh, North America, and of course, in frozen products, it can have a very very long survival time. In terms of the host range, uh, still today it's inconclusive what role water buffalo might play in this. I have not seen anything that's come out of Asia as of yet uh, because water buffalo were quite popular in South Asia. Uh, African buffalo uh, uh, have not been infected, but experimentally we've shown that they can be infected. And this would include uh, species that we might see in zoos across the U.S. Uh, that have oryx, giraffe, impalas, or other uh, cloven hoof animals. Um, and you can see a table here 
of a number of different species that can potentially be infected um, either experimentally or as a wild host, such as yaks. Um, uh, so we have to just be aware of the naive population and what this could mean to, say, uh, um, uh, the uh, mountain sheep in, uh, in the Colorados and things of that sort. The virus of lumpy skin disease does uh, will infect and replicate in sheep and goats, but it doesn't cause clinical disease in sheep and goats. Um, and just and vice versa, the sheep and goat pox virus will infect cattle, but it won't cause clinical disease. And this is one of the reasons uh, we will use we can use sheep and goat uh, virus vaccines uh, to protect against lumpy skin disease, which is presently what's occurring in Asia. In terms of the pathology, uh, it starts out as a papular vesicular form, so you'll get uh, slightly raised uh, hyperemic areas within the skin. Uh, they begin to gray as the epithelium starts to, to die, and then you'll get a crusting. Occasionally, you'll get a vesicle formation, but oftentimes this is not the case in lumpy skin disease. More common in lumpy skin disease, this is what we call nodular form, and in this case, uh, we have virus that's causing disease not only in the epithelium, but it's also in the, in the uh, hypodermis and epidermis where you have connective tissue and vasculature, and we'll show just some brief information on the pathology of that uh, later in the presentation. In both forms, so no matter what form you see this disease in, you always have to keep in mind that if you're seeing cutaneous lesions, the pathology is systemic. So the pathology will be or can be anywhere there's epithelium in the body. So the respiratory tract, the GI tract, the urinary tract, uh, liver, other tissues. So this is really a systemic disease we only see the cutaneous manifestations grossly. So as I mentioned, so you can expect to see a systemic viral disease. So you expect lymphoid system. Lymph nodes uh, can be enlarged, congested, and edematous and hemorrhagic. It can affect the respiratory system, which can cause uh, difficulty in breathing or coughing or uh, respiratory or nasal discharge. The gastrointestinal system can be disseminated or localized with mucosal lesions and the cardiovascular system. We actually can see a vasculitis with lumpy skin disease. In terms of morbidity and mortality, the morbidity is quite a wide range. Uh, the reason for this is because it depends on the host and it can be age dependent. It also depends on the virus itself. So the viral strain in a combination with the host and age, but then also it's vector dependent. We will talk about this in just a bit, but uh, lumpy skin disease, unlike sheep and goat pox, is primarily transmitted through vectors. Um, and this is mechanical vectors. So the presence of vectors such as flies can play a big role in the morbidity that you're seeing on a, on a farm or premise. In terms of mortality, typically it's low mortality, 1% to 2%. As I mentioned, you can see uh, systemic disease. So if you have uh, vasculitis and that's associated with the myocardium, you could have um, heart issues and things of that sort. You would tend to see more mortality in younger animals, which might have more fulminant disease. But you can see mortality that can reach up to 85%. And this, again, depends on the host, the age, the viral strain, and potentially uh, the vector, because the vectors are inoculating this virus directly into the host. So when we talk about the sources of the virus from the host, because it's a systemic disease, basically anything that you get from that host. So secretions, saliva, nasal, feces, the scabs, of course, from the cutaneous lesions, those scabs, when they dry, they can be aerosolized. 
Uh, so in a in a premise, if you're cleaning a barn, if you're power washing in a barn, things of that sort, you can aerosolize the virus. And then, of course, fomites, so vehicles, litter. Uh, sorry, we have wool here, but uh, but uh, anything from that animal uh, can be a source of that mumpy skin Z virus. And then most importantly, our insects as mechanical vectors. And then any tissues, blood, urine, and all tissues, including fetus and fetal membranes, are infectious for lumpy skin disease virus. The transmission, again, is different than sheep and goat pox. Uh, sheep and goat pox is the primary route of transmission is direct contact. Lumpy skin disease virus, the primary route of transmission is through mechanical vectors, mosquitoes, flies, midges, and recently identified also ticks can transmit lumpy skin disease virus. Direct contact can still play a role. It's been shown that it can play a role, uh, but it tends to be a minor role in the transmission of this disease. And then keeping in mind in terms of animal or transmission, mission of this disease, the virus survives for a long period of time in the environment under the right conditions. So anything that's contaminated fomites uh, can serve as a reservoir for this disease. And so the spread is related to movement of cattle, cattle but also mechanical vectors. So movement of mosquitoes, flies, midges, and ticks. Okay? Uh, there is no reported carrier state of this disease. So this is just uh, more detailed in terms of the transmission. So any blood feeding arthropods can potentially uh, uh, transmit this disease. The virus doesn't replicate in these. These are mechanical vectors, but the Aedes mosquitoes, uh, the common stable fly, the, the biting fly, Stomoxus calcitrans, but also other species of flies have been shown to transmit lumpy skin disease virus. Culicoides or midges can transmit this disease. And then ticks can also transmit this disease. So we have to be aware of this um, if this disease is to enter uh, the northern hemisphere and uh, our western hemisphere and um, become an issue here. So when we think about animal transmission in terms of primary route, mosquitoes and flies, we have to think about this as a means of control for this disease or even a means of prevention of disease. So controlling vectors, um, it's, a, it's critical in the control of this disease. Here, we're looking at an animal where you had a sit fast, the, the lesion has popped out of the, the height of the uh, this cattle, uh, and they've applied a basically an insecticide to try and kill these flies and try and present, prevent the transmission of disease in a premise. So now we're going to get into the clinical signs. We have an incubation period of five days to five weeks. This is important. <laughs> And we still don't understand uh, the pathogenesis of this, why it can take up to five weeks for this disease from the time an animal has contact or is inoculated with lumpy skin disease virus that it, uh, you develop fulminant disease. This becomes a problem when you talk about uh, quarantine facilities. So if animals are coming across borders, if they're coming into uh, the U.S., uh, and you have a five-week five week window of potential incubation for this disease, uh, this could be a, a problem that we have to be aware of. Uh, we can have inapparent. I put in asymptomatic. I think everyone knows what asymptomatic means now because of the COVID virus. So you can have asymptomatic animals. They're infected. The virus replicating shed virus. And as I mentioned in our experimental work on Plum Island, when we're working with sheep pox virus, if we put it into Suffolk sheep, uh, they get a fever. If you 
if you look at their temperature, but if you don't look at their temperature, you would never know if they were infected with chief pox virus. You can see the same thing with lumpy skin disease. So you can have inapparent asymptomatic uh, animals, but you can also have what you would uh, normally expect would be severe infection. Oftentimes this, of course, is worse in young animals, and the hallmarks are elevated temperature, uh, if they're dairy, you see start to see a decreased milk yields, and then, of course, lameness can be a problem uh, in cattle as well. So what we look for are raised, circular, firm nodules that coalesce into plaques. These can be anywhere on the body. They harden into sit fast and shed. This is over approximately a 10-day period. They're swollen. Ten uh, you can see a swollen, tender udder or testicles. You also begin, again, remember this is systemic disease, so you can see lesions of the oral and nasal cavities, so the tongue, the hard palate, uh, you can see lesions. And then if you have uh, uh, breeding cattle or if you have bulls, you can see abortion and sterility with this disease. So, Characteristic skin nodules, uh, lesions in the mucosal membranes or throughout the GI tract, nodules in the lungs, hemorrhages in the spleen, liver, and rumen. So here we're just looking in the nasal cavity, and you can see uh, these lesions where this actually has peeled off. This has been peeled from one side to the other. So again, just think systemic, because whenever you see cutaneously, envision that you could potentially have lesions within the lungs, GI, uh, urinary tract, and other organ systems. So now we're just going to go through a number of, of images. Uh, I think the best way to recognize disease is to just see it over and over until it just, it's something that's second nature. Um, and many of you out in the field, you probably see things similar to this uh, with other diseases that are out there, such as papular stomatitis, uh, dermatophilus, um, uh, insect bites, things of that sort. Uh, an animal like this, uh, you might just be thinking about uh, uh, insect bites, uh, things of that sort, whereas you might have a different perception if you're looking at an animal like this or a calf with a fulminant disease similar to this. And then, of course, if depending on the situation, when we're talking about cattle, we have recognized that in dairy, you have intimate contact with those animals on a regular basis, but when you're looking at uh, a beef cattle industry, uh, your contact is usually from a distance unless you're running them through shoots for vaccination. So when you look at a herd of animals, such as this, uh, you're going to be looking for uh, less apparent clinical signs, and that might be lameness, or you're looking for, say, roughened hair coat, which would suggest that there could be something going on uh, in animals, whether it's the calves or, or the cows. Uh, so you're just looking for something that, that would suggest that there's an underlying problem. And that can even be that the animals are off feed because you can have lesions within the oral cavity on the tongue, on the muzzle, for example. So here we're looking at lumpy skin disease, uh, pertinent for this disease. You have these cutaneous nodules. Nodules will gradually get larger and larger until you begin to get death of the epithelium, and then uh, these lesions slough. So that's at the point where you get the conical sit fast, as they're called. So here we're looking at an animal. Uh, you can clearly see them in the white-haired areas. They're present in the black-haired areas as well. Uh, you just can't readily see them in that condition. Um, so, example of lumpy skin disease. If anyone's been in the Plum Island training course, you might recognize the tiles from containment. So, lumpy skin disease, just in a different breed. Uh, again, these are more, these lesions have progressed a little bit more than the previous one. They're still
still raised firm nodules, but now they're becoming the product in the center, and eventually all of these will create essentially holes within the eyes, uh, which are slow to heal in because it's a full thickness lesion in the skin of the animal. So just another example. Uh, things, if you have solitary lesions in a certain area of the animal, you might be thinking of a cutaneous tuberculosis, cutaneous TB, or some other disease that's affecting lymphoid system um, because you will get reactive lymph nodes depending on where these lesions are. I think this is a good, good example uh, of bumpy skin disease. Again, just other breeds to see how these might appear different uh, because it all depends on, you know, whether they have a, a long hair coat, short hair coat, color of the coat, things of that sort. Um, very, very small nodules in this animal, okay, from a distance, you might not recognize that there's any problem. Maybe the animal was off feed, then you get up close and you can uh, potentially see these lesions. Uh, here's uh, some images of lumpy skin disease out of Albania. Um, so I think you can readily see here, and you can expect that this animal is febrile, off feed. Uh, if this was a pregnant cow, uh, you might see abortion. Um, and of course, if it's a milking cow, you might see, or you will see, uh, decreased milk yield and then potentially lameness in this animal. So just a number of different examples. Uh, you can see lesions in the mammary glands, the skin, the mammary glands again, lesions on the muzzle, okay? They appear a little bit different. It's a mucous membrane, it's a wet membrane, uh, but you will, will see lesions here as well as within the oral cavity. Hey, Rich, this is Liz. Um, yes. Sometimes your your audio is going a little wonky, so we're thinking maybe you should just turn your video off. So I'm sorry. We won't be able to see you, okay. but it might help with bandwidth, so. Oh, with the bandwidth? Well, but, yeah. okay, I, I'll do whatever you say. Okay. Okay. <laughs> shutting, shutting off video. Okay. Uh -oh. <laughs> Hi, everybody. <laughs> I can do it. Uh, it won't let me stop my video. Let's see if that works. Okay. Perfect. So, Thank you. Um, so here we're looking at the sit fast. So these lesions are full thickness in the skin, and they are conical-shaped lesions. They are equivalent to a throm uh, a, um, a thrombosis uh, uh, with an infarct. Uh, within the skin, and I'll show you examples of this. So you can actually peel these lesions out of the animal's coat. So we have example of the nodules. As they become necrotic, they take on the term, the, the so-called sit fast. And actually, if you were to get in there with forceps or even fingers, you can actually uh, pop these lesions right out, and they will readily come right out of the hide. They're well demarcated. Here's an example where you had a lesion that's affecting the, the rear claw of the animal, and that whole claw will just slough when we're just below. We've had a sit fast that, is, that has come out. And of course, you can expect that there'll be secondary uh, bacterial problems with this animal, so you can have uh, blindness that becomes persistent in animals that have had this disease, but so see more progressive lesions. Uh, this is going to be 14, 14, 20 days out from the time the animal is first infected. See how well demarcated they are. You can see a good demarcation here, and then. It, it pops out, and you can see the epidermis, the underlying dermis with the smooth muscle, and then underlying the adipose tissue. So it is a full thickness skin lesion. 
I think this is a, an excellent example of what you can see. And so, as you would expect on any farm, most any farm, this is going to be covered with ice. And those flies are a mechanical vector that will transmit this disease from one animal to the other. So uh, vector control, um, pest control is very, very important in managing this disease once you have it on a premise. And then just, just a close-up lesion of the, that muzzle uh, of an animal with lumpy skin disease. I just think it's important to see some of these uh, with a uh, full screen. Screen, you can see there's not much going on this muzzle except for this single solitary lesion. Of course, you don't see the rest of the animal, um, but if you have a, a subclinical or asymptomatic animal, this could be all that you would detect in, in an outbreak where you have a specific virus, you have, say, a different breeds of cattle on a farm, something of that sort, and this animal isn't being as uh, uh, responsive or having as fulminant disease as you might expect another breed of animal. As I mentioned, this is systemic disease. So here we're looking in the nasal terminates. So we're looking at the terminates, and you can see these raised lesions, the hyperemia around them. These are pox lesions. Again, up in the nasal turbinates, you can see where this has become demarcated. So think of this same thing as what's occurring in the skin, full thickness. So you've got the epithelium, the underlying uh, dermis, and this whole section of tissue will just slough out of this area in the nasal turbinates. Trachea. Multifocal, so we probably had a pox lesion here, and one here, and one here, and they all become confluent. And eventually, all of this material is going to slough. That's another one within the trachea. Systemic disease. Here we have uh, numerous foci uh, within the trachea. This is a small animal and you can see readily these pox lesions with the hyperema around them become well demarcated. The white in the center here is actually uh, non-viable or necrotic tissue. And, excuse me, pox lesions within the lungs. So they can be, they can be random throughout the lungs. They typically start in the small airways, the respiratory, uh, bronchioles, and they just become large. They can become confluent, and the same thing will occur. The tissue is going to die. The tissue is going to be sloughed. That tissue would eventually be absorbed, but more than likely to cause coughing in that animal. So just as an example, pox lesions in the lung. Can we the disease on the the visceral surface, but when you do on cut section, here you can see a larger airway, and then these respiratory bronchioles surrounded by hyperplastic epithelium, and then the hyperemia is the inflammation that's surrounding this. So the pox virus is all here, and this is all inflammation. And then we interstitial edema uh, in these cows. So uh, cattle. So you can expect again to see res respiratory uh, clinical presentations, coughing, uh, respiratory difficulty if these animals are working or being walked. Um, and it's not going to be every animal. Remember that morbidity, mortality rate. So it's, it's really going to depend on the animal, the virus, and how big a dose they were inoculated with. And I say inoculated because it's mechanical vectors that transmit the disease. Uh, Interesting edema again. You can see whenever you get foam on the surface of a cut lung, it tells you you have uh, a degree of epi uh, epi uh, sorry, edema of the lungs. So I'm just going to go through this quick. Uh, the pox viruses are very large viruses. Uh, 
In fact, you can just barely see pox viruses with a light microscope. <laughs> so they're, they're getting close to the size of a bacterium. Uh, um, because they have such a large genome, they make proteins for everything. And so they actually produce growth factors for epithelium and vascular endothelium. So they're proliferating epithelium for the virus to infect and grow in. The reason this is important, we don't want to go into all this immunology detail, but the virus takes over the animal's immune response. Um, and this is how the virus causes, can cause such fulminant disease in a short period of time. So when we look at these cutaneous lesions, when we look at these conical and uh, uh, sit fasts, as we call them, so just lesions in different breeds of animal, different hides. But look at these microscopically. You've just basically got death of the epithelium and death of everything underneath it. Here's normal epithelium, normal hypodermis, normal dermis, and here it's all dead. And what you'll see typically at the base of these are large blood vessels. And if you look at these, whoops. Look at large blood vessels, there's vasculite, and end up being thrombosis. So you basically have the cutaneous infarct. And those infarcts are, as you always remember, triangular. That's why you can pull these things out in just, you know, one easy pull because you have all this scar tissue forming around it. And what's important, though, is you see myocarditis. Okay, this is inflammation in the vessel of the heart, any other visceral organ you can see inflammation. With histiocyte macrophages infected with lumpy skin disease virus. That's the pathology we're going to cover. So then we talk about transmission. So there is no evidence of lumpy skin, skin disease virus uh, affecting humans. And I have a butt here in red. This is actually monkeypox. If you remember our monkeypox outbreak that a, uh, over a decade ago coming into us from uh, uh, Gambian rats at the time. But in the, uh, 2019, there was a, a report of lumpy skin disease virus in a human. This is the lumpy skin disease virus H, LSDH, uh, LSDV with an H, human. Um, and this is a compared study of lumpy skin disease virus in humans. This is out of Egypt. I've seen no other publications, and actually I have not seen this pub referenced in any other, any other publications. So I don't know exactly where this stands, um, but they basically, through and isolated the virus. They have electron micrographs. They have genetic testing um, of certain gene sequencing. They, uh, they didn't do a full sequence of this virus. And interesting, uh, in the human patients that this occurred in, they also had, uh, they were also had human herpes virus. Uh, so I don't know exactly what the situation is with this. There is no indication of any immunosuppression or anything of that sort. So I just put this out there as a note. Um, there's something that we uh, just want to be aware of. And there's also been, if you get into social media, uh, there are chat rooms. Uh, this is a chat room uh, um, of a veterinarian in India questioning whether lumpy skin disease is zoonotic uh, based on something that had been seen uh, within the country of India where there's ongoing outbreaks of lumpy skin disease. So this is just important to note, uh, but regardless of what you think it is, um, it's always gonna be best in the proper PPE. And the reason I say that is there are diseases that look like lumpy skin disease, but are not. And some of you would be aware of those because they do occur uh, in North America uh, that is bovine papular stomatitis caused by parapox virus. So this would be our, our 
uh, calf or cattle form of orf in sheep. Um, there's bovine papular stomatitis. And of course, this can infect people. Uh, so you, this is bovine papular stomatitis or a parapox virus. Uh, lesion in someone just showing through the progression of healing on the hands of an animal. So no matter what, proper PE is indicated uh, wearing gloves uh, when we're dealing with these. Um, and this uh, so-called pseudo cowpox uh, disease caused by the paravaccinia virus, the pseudo cowpox virus. So again, uh, this is uh, would be similar to ORF that we see in gene. We're all aware that that is a, a zoonosis. So you just have to be aware of that. Okay. So one of the reasons that we're here today is is that uh, lumpy skin disease has caused outbreaks in China, uh, in Southeast Asia. The outbreak in China, the first outbreak was. 3rd of August 2014, and since then, what's been reported are eight lumpy skin disease outbreaks in seven provinces in China. Morbidity and mortality is ranged uh, from 6.6 .6 to 100% in terms of morbidity, zero to 16.7% in terms of mortality. And this kind of fits with what we've already discussed in terms of morbidity and mortality that you would expect with lumpy skin disease. So this is just here, so I I excerpts out of these documents. They're all in Chinese. Um, so this is the notes from the Ministry of Agricultural and Rural Affairs, what's called MARA, uh, their government, on, on the technical specifications for prevention and control of nodular disease in cattle. This is the term they're using. This is lumpy skin disease. <clears throat> What they've determined uh, sequencing is that the virus that they're seeing in China is most closely related to a virus that was in Russia. So this lumpy skin disease virus, Russia, uh, Saratov, 2017. And this appears to be a, uh, a strain that is a recombination of a vaccine strain uh, with uh, 27 recombinants uh, that has resulted in, in then again, a uh, virulent lumpy skin disease virus. To date, the gen genomic sequence of the isolate that is in China has not been available online, uh, though it can be uh, um, it can it can be gotten, but you can't get it in these genetic uh, data banks that are used for uh, genomic sequencing. So again, going to ministry, this is documents of the Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Affairs. Ultimately, every province, just like the state, every state kind of does their own thing in management. So these are different provinces. Their notices on how to manage lumpy skin disease. For the most part, uh, what they're doing is using a goat pox vaccine, five times the dose of goats to be used for the prevention of bovine nodular skin disease. And this has been the practice across China. You can get some provinces, so I just took ex excerpts uh, in translation, these translation apps. So basically, uh, a province, uh, Fujian province, uh, has recommended not to use any vaccines for control of the disease. Um, Whereas other provinces, they're using that goat pox vaccine at five times the goat dosage. And this is actually what's being uh, used across most of China. Uh, from recent conversations that I had uh, <clears throat> with colleagues in China that are working in the dairy industry, is that most of the large commercial dairies have vaccinated their animals with goat pox vaccine at this five times the normal dose for goats. We look at China in terms of where it's occurred. You have these provinces in the southeast, and then that original case, which was in the province in the uh, in the northwest of China. So here's that case, 2019, in the northwest of China, 
and then that initial case by 15th, 2020, and then rapidly within uh, <clears throat> within just a couple weeks, it was spreading throughout uh, these southeast provinces within China. And then you began to see movement of virus uh, lumpy skin disease virus in India and Bhutan uh, and Nepal. This is a publication, recent publication of lumpy skin disease out of India. Uh, and I, you know, they're showing the cutaneous lesions. Uh, you can see this would be of quite significance in the country of India where uh, uh, euthanasia of cattle is forbidden in some areas depending on where you are in India because of religious beliefs um, in terms of uh, cattle. And when we look at the lumpy skin disease virus isolate, isolate in India through phenotypic mapping, uh, this India isolate is most closely related to a Kenyan isolate. And then you can look at other relations, but the suggestion is that this virus uh, came from a different route than the virus that showed up in China, which is alerting because it tells you that there's more than one virus that's circulating in Asia. This is lumpy skin disease report in Vietnam 2020. Again, we're looking at a different breed of animal. You can see the cutaneous lesions. And for this isolate, uh, they looked at the phenotypic thing and this phenotypically mapped to be related to that isolate that's in China. And so the issue is, uh, of course, um, you know, it's the first outbreak in Vietnam. Uh, phenotypic mapping suggests that the disease may have been introduced into Vietnam via the border of China. Um, but, of course, uh, you don't know that for sure. It could have come in through other routes directly into China or into Vietnam. Um, it's also interesting to note that this is, again, it's a new virus, viral strain, a new uh, cluster uh, when you look at the phenotypic mapping um, associated with this uh, Russian isolate. And so we have to look at this the unique evolutionary characteristics of this virus as opposed to, for example, what's occurring in India right now. And we need to really look at whole genome sequencing to really understand what's occurring with these new viral isolates that are impacting uh, Asia. This is a map uh, from FAO uh, showing where these outbreaks have occurred in Asia to cattle density, so population density. So this is in a very dense air cattle population, and you can, of course, see that India overall has a dense population. Uh, so far in China, I've not seen reports that this has occurred in the northeast of China where their most dense population level are. <clears throat> I will skip that one. So this is kind of where we are now. This is uh, lumpy skin disease uh, in 2020 to present. So these are cases. This is off the OIE's uh, new uh, uh, search tool. So we look at all these isolates. They're, they're color-coded according to the relationship. So this is one virus that spreads throughout an area, and then a, a new phenotype and a new phenotype. And we can kind of see how this virus has kind of worked its way up and around. Uh, Kazakhstan has never reported these diseases. It's more it's probably an issue of reporting than not having the disease. Um, so we can see that there are a number of cases. And again, because the colors represent related cases, uh, we can see that there are a number of outbreaks occurring uh, uh, across the globe. This is looking at what's resolved and what's uh, ongoing. So we're looking at resolved lumpy skin disease in the green and ongoing cases in this uh, light orange. So we do have ongoing disease. And so when we look at it on a broad scale, um, all of these areas are considered uh, to have lumpy skin disease present. This is just looking from January. 
So this is just 2021. So the same type of maps uh, where we have related outbreaks, resolved outbreaks, and then how we would break this down in terms of where the disease is present. I think what's important is to understand the epidemiology and the disease movement as we track this disease, and this you do through this phenotypic mapping. You can track this disease uh, out of Africa into Eastern Bloc countries, into, uh, into European countries, uh, into uh, Middle East, and then down into Mongolia, uh, through Russia, and, and then outbreaks breaking out in Southeast China, and then coming from a different route, because it's a different phenotypic isolate, uh, spreading to different areas, coming into uh, different areas of the world. So it gets quite complex. And you can expect that this is most likely associated movement of animals or fomites. So diagnosis, the suspect clinical characteristics of the disease, the sit-fast fever, uh, low mortality, maybe low morbidity. It's not going to be what you would expect with foot and mouth disease. Not every animal is going to be sick. It's going to be a few animals in a herd of animals. Laboratory tests, of course, now it's qPCR is going to be your quickest, quickest diagnostic assay. Unless you have an electron microscope, uh, you can get a diagnosis with electron microscopy within about 30 minutes um, from a lesion, uh, making what's called a negative slide, and throw it on an electron microscope, and you can see these viral particles quite readily. Virus isolation serology tend to be on the back burner because they're, uh, they take a longer period. And of course, serology is not what you're going to be looking for in our case in, the, uh, uh, in North America because uh, we hope to catch it before we have seropositive animals. So this is a uh, diagnosis breakdown. It's actually fairly good from FAO guidelines, but it ultimately says the same thing. You have cutaneous uh, uh, lesions, contagious disease, characteristic inverted conical sit fast, and persistent fever, emaciation, low mortality, low mortality and low morbidity. And then when we go to laboratory diagnosis, it's hidden in here, but PCR is going to be what you're going to go for. PCR now, uh, with the work that's come out of COVID, we can get uh, results within under an hour. Differential diagnoses, pseudo-lumpy skin disease. We've talked about this, bovine herpes virus 2, bovine herpes mammalitis, which is also a bovine herpes virus 2, dermatophilus, ringworm, insect tick bites, Rinderpest is no longer on the list, but I keep it there just to remind us. Demodex, hypoderma, bovis, uh, photosensitization, photosensitization, bovine papillary stomatitis. Remember, this is the pseudocalpox. This is a zoonosis, okay? Urticaria, cutaneous tuberculosis, and onchocercosis. So here's an example of Pseudo-lumpy skin disease, this is bovine herpes virus 2, this is systemic disease, uh, which could look like lumpy skin disease, and we can see bovine herpes virus 2 in the United States. Most often see this is uh, bovine papillary stomatitis. So here are some differentials, bovine papillary stomatitis, zoonotic, parapox, dermatophilus, raised lesions, but it's actually within the hair coat, okay? Uh, bovine herpes virus, fulminant disease, uh, bovine herpes mammalitis, okay? So just examples of some differentials. In terms of, uh, you know, prevention and control, there's a lot in this document. This is actually a document, again, out of FAO. When we look at the introduction of disease, some things to be aware of is awareness, so training people, which is what we're doing right here. But it doesn't just come down to the veterinarians in the field. You've got to talk to the farming communities, 
and people that are working every day with these animals. So the stakeholders, farmers, uh, stockades, sale barns, things of that sort. Those people should be aware of this disease. Enhanced active and passive surveillance, which would likely be through our NOM system, and enhanced biosecurity, and again, vector control measures on farms. Start these practices now in terms of vector control and biosecurity because they can become very important if we are to see a disease outbreak. This should be an ongoing practice, enhanced biosecurity and vector control. So here we're looking at vaccination. Again, five times the, the uh, dose for goat pox vaccine. I don't think we'll be doing any vaccinating in the U.S., but there are vaccines out there. Most of these are autogenous vaccines, attenuated virus in the country of origin. Uh, Merck has lumpy vax, uh, which China is trying to get approved right now. Um, but it's an expensive vaccine, so I think most of Asia is going to be working with the goat pox vaccine in terms of control. China has their own vaccines. Again, these are a goat pox. It's a little blurred out on this image, but it's a goat pox vaccine. Goat pox vaccine that's being used to control lumpy skin disease. So. The other thing we have to keep in mind is we can't just be looking at animals. We have to look at other potential means of transmission. So disease transmission and risk. Here we're looking at the world mapping of animal feed systems. We have to keep in mind that uh, our source of roughage in the U.S. doesn't all come from the U.S. It comes from other countries. Um, but more importantly, source of concentrates, vitamins and other concentrates, the biggest producer of concentrates is China, and we are actually the biggest importer of concentrates from China for use in feed animal production. So we have to be aware of these sources that can potentially be contaminated. And I think we're all aware of this, you know, air transportation, sea transportation around the world, ships, planes, people, and animals. Um, these things are on the move. This is a paper that came out of Scott D. in Kansas. This is actually in response to African swine fever. Uh, lumpy skin disease virus, or the pox virus, is very similar to African swine fever virus in terms of its survivability or stability in the environment. So information that we gained from this study can also be high dumpy skin disease. So if we compare it to African swine fever, all of these potential feed ingredients can harbor the virus and the virus will survive in overseas shipments of these feed ingredients. Okay? Whether it's dry dog food, moist dog food, cat food, choline, lysine, uh, soy oil, soy soybean, uh, meal and soybean meal uh, conventional, so organic or conventional. So these are all potential sources of, of this virus. So to wrap up here, so the Silk Road, going back thousands of years in history, uh, was, a, was a prominent way for China to move silk out of its country. So this is all part of trade. Um, but rebuilding the Silk Road. This is their Belt and Road Initiative. They are building railroads and roadways uh, from China all the way into Spain and Madrid. So, and they're going to the sea coast, of course, and they're going south into Southeast Asia and then treks into India. These are all shipping port areas. So no matter what's occurring here, that material can end up in Spain, and then from Spain it goes to what can expect. So drivers influencing this trade are economic growth, animal production trends, consumption patterns, political relationship. You know, we're kind of iffy with China still, but it's going to change. Geographical proximity and obstacles, mountains and seas, 
But again, with this Belt and Road Initiative of China tying in all of Asia into Europe, these mountains and sea obstacles are not going to be obstacles anymore. In fact, they aren't even today. Um, and then disparities in commodities. You know, if the price is better over the border, you send your animals over the border. And this is a big problem. Um, so we have to be aware of what's occurring in our PED. How did it get here? African swine fever hasn't come, but it's on the move still within Asia. And then, of course, avian influenza is a good thing to follow. Um, and then this Belt and Road Initiative uh, being conducted by China. This is actually a map that shows the movement of animals in Southeast Asia. And this is specifically uh, the movement of cattle, uh, cattle and buffalo, live animals. Uh, these are formal and informal trade flow. So no matter where animals come from these days, uh, we have to have quarantine measures in place and always suspect that there's a potential for transmission of disease or introduction. So going back to the map and the movement of lumpy skin disease virus just since 2020. So this is really just in the last um, 15 months. So coming back, China is doing this belt and road. They're connecting all of Asia and Europe and into the African continent and then shipping routes airline routes, they go everywhere. This is actually ASA license an airline route or a shipping route, sorry, shipping, uh, out of Dubai, and all their shipping is for products of Africa. And this includes animals, air or sea. So we will skip that. Well, I just want this part. When we think about lumpy skin disease, we have to think about imports of animals, chickies, fomites, vectors, whether it's legal or illegal. The illegal side can be through airlines and someone just carrying something in their suitcase, um, which is their favorite uh, beef product or sausage or something to that extent. We have to understand that this disease is occurring in a part of the world which has the largest uh, um, <clears throat> cattle production. This is the country of India. Brazil falls behind that. Brazil hasn't been impacted yet, but then right behind that is China. And this is what's at risk in the United States. This is a... Uh, a product of uh, FLI or, or a coalition of European countries. This is called DEFEND. Uh, so they are basically mapping and tracking uh, both lumpy skin disease and African swine fever. So it's a good resource for you to go to if you want to get more information on this disease because this is knocking on their door. I'll end here. Uh, there are, and I looked at, there are over 50 videos on YouTube on lumpy skin disease in every language in the country where it's occurred. Uh, I think what's most important here is you can go through these videos and, and just see examples. See example after example after example and just become familiar with it and it will become second nature. And I'll end here, Liz. All right, thanks very much. We do have some questions for you. Um, the okay. first one is, how long can the virus survive in a lumpy skin infected carcass? Like for example, the skin. Okay, so, um, so if an animal, so if it dies and, and uh, you know, it, say it's untouched, uh, and you get desiccation, you know, again, it depends on where it dies and how it decays. But in, in a dead animal, that virus will, will survive, uh, for extended periods. Um, and if it's an animal that, um, is literally, it's not buried and it's lying, say it's a, a beef steer, it's out on range and you, you didn't see it and it becomes desiccated, you can still have viral 
viable virus in that desiccated hide. And I think we all recognize that the hide is usually the last thing to go. Um, and uh, if it's protected from sun and, and a number of the elements, that virus can be a viable literally for months. Okay. So the next question is, the virus can replicate in sheep and goats. Can they transmit the disease to cattle? <laughs> it's a good question. So the, the answer would be yes. <laughs> the, uh, and this is one of those things that's not well understood because they're all, you know, as I mentioned, it's one serotype. They're all phenotypically closely related. There is isn't big genetic differences in sheep virus or <coughs> goat pox virus or lumpy skin disease virus. Um, but lumpy skin virus in sheep or goats will be uh, asymptomatic, but the virus will still replicate and the virus could be shed by that animal. But that period of shedding is going to be rather low because the animal uh, will de develop a readily develop an immune response. So probably within uh, within under 21 days, that animal is not going to be shedding virus and causing infections. And you have to remember that, uh, again, we're dealing with a virus that in cattle, the primary route of transmission is mechanical vectors. So contact transmission is not as important. It's not as well understood, again, why that's the case. Um, but, uh, but it is possible for if you inoculate a goat with lumpy skin disease virus, that it'll transmit, could transmit that disease to cattle. Yes. Okay, that's a couple questions from the same person. The first one is, what countermeasures can be put in place in a country free of lumpy skin disease when neighboring countries have reported the disease? So, first of all is, is border restrictions. Um, and it, again, it depends on the country. Uh, some borders can be quite loose and there can be quite a bit of animal movement, but you have to really prevent movement of the animals and movement of any uh, fomite that could potentially be contaminated. So any materials from animals, uh, whether that's hides, you know, you might have hides that go from one country to another that are processed for leather or things of that sort. So animals and animal products, you got to you got to block that movement, but then you also have to think about vehicles because uh, vehicles can carry this virus. The virus can survive in trucks, uh, lorries, uh, um, and things of that sort. And then also people can uh, uh, potentially carry this unknowingly uh, through products that they might carry a, across borders. When you're talking about Vector control, it gets a little bit more difficult. Uh, ticks, you usually don't have to worry about. Ticks don't have a, uh, a range, a big range that they move. But when you're talking about culicoides or uh, flies, uh, they can actually have quite a range. Uh, so those can be a potential problem. So on the on the side where you don't have the disease, you really have to implement uh, really good vector control, especially if you're on a bordering uh, province or region, uh, because it can be brought to a vector. Okay, can we expect to stop the virus once it is established in a region? And are there successful stories of countries that were able to clear the virus from its territory and becoming LSD free again? Oh, yes. Absolutely. Um, this, uh, the vaccines are, are readily efficacious for control of this disease, um, and the safety of the vaccines is good. Uh, so you can, you know, if, if you can't, if you don't get a handle on the disease when it originally occurs through a uh, identification, so rapid detection and a depopulation, to control the disease, then you can bring in vaccine measures such as ring vaccinations and things of that sort to to bring the disease under control and then get 
through an eradication through uh, eradicating vaccinated animals, which you can test through serology and things of that sort, and eventually eradicate this disease. Yes, you can bring this disease under control uh, readily. So another question is, are the lesions painful or just when they become raw after sloughing? Sloughing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So uh, the uh, one of the things you'll notice when you look at most of these animals, uh, you don't see evidence of them uh, uh, rubbing. You know, like we talk about scrapey. You know, that, that's why you call the disease scrapey because they're uh, they're paritic and they're they're itching and they're rubbing these. But you. If you notice on almost all of these animals, you don't notice that. Uh, so the the lesions, but I can't tell you from a cow's perspective that they're not painful, but they don't cause the animal enough irritation that they're trying to, you know, rub their neck, rub their muzzle, things of that sort. Um, and if you look at the the pattern of inflammation and how they slough. Uh, you can surmise that these that the lesions are are not painful or not or not causing enough irritation that it bothers the animal. And those anim animals where where it sloughs out, the biggest irritation is probably going to be from secondary bacterial, which is likely going to be associated with mechanical vectors, flies, or bacteria that are getting into these lesions. Of course, if they're so, on an area like the udder and they're milking cows, that's completely different, or if they're on the feet where they're causing lameness, that's a different situation. How effective are the vaccines in cattle? Uh, they are very effective. Um, this is one of the unique things about this disease that uh, that the uh, the vaccines are cross-protective, so again, sheep and goat vaccine will be protective against lumpy skin disease virus. Uh, the Netling vaccine, uh, which is the uh, uh, the Merck vaccine, is highly efficacious and it's a safe vaccine. But again, one of the things that at least China is saying in a publication out of Russia is that this strain that's occurred in Russia and China is is a uh, is a variant built on the uh, the vaccine strain. They call it a vaccine-like strain, but we don't have the whole genome sequence, so we don't know exactly what's occurring there and how this virus may have evolved. The next question is, how do you recommend to control all the flies? <laughs> if anyone, <laughs> uh, I, I, I probably would have given this talk if I knew how to control flies. I'd, I'd be in uh, uh, a nice resort island somewhere with a, <laughs> I'd probably own the whole island. Controlling flies. But actually, there is a means that you can do. So uh, if you look at most of the stable flies, Stamoxis, Calcitrans, Musca domestica, the flies that we typically see on farms, uh, their life cycle is through manure. Um, so, so manure or wet uh, uh, um, wet areas that are contaminated. So wet, um, I'm sorry, wet wood shavings, wet straw, manure. Those are all areas where flies will lay their eggs. So. Controlling manure, manure piles, and things of that sort is critical to controlling vectors. If you can remove manure, keep barns dry and clean as much as possible, and that includes the wood shavings that get urinated on and things of that sort, uh, if you can control that, take the manure off-site uh, or deal with it in a different way, and then you break the life cycle of the fly. And that's a, a critical control measure. There is, of course, a number of baits that are that you can put out and things of that sort. But if you're putting out baits, you already have flies. If you want to prevent flies, it's manure control. Next question is, are, what's the risk for import of lumpy skin disease to the U.S. via feed from China? Um, <laughs> 
Well, I, I think the risk the risk exists. I, I would say that the risk is really no different than it is, well, it's lower than it is from African swine fever, um, only because African swine fever was much more prevalent in China than lumpy skin disease is reported to be. But in terms of the stability and survivability of the virus in feed and feed ingredients, uh, it, it's just as viable as African swine fever. So the risk is lower than what we what we were saying for African swine fever, um, but it, the risk is there, and we just have to recognize that actually the the bulk, in fact. I believe all of the vitamin supplements that we're using in feeds in the U.S. are out of China. And it depends on the quality control in China. Uh, another question is, are there lumpy skin disease concerns with the recent imports of dogs rescued from Chinese slaughter markets? Are we doing that in the U.S.? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know we were bringing in dogs from China, but I knew it was an issue uh, because China has banned the consumption of dogs, uh, though it, it's still done, it's, it's banned. Um, uh, but it, uh, dogs, uh, I don't know of any reports of dogs being infected with the disease and things of that sort. What would be more of an issue are the means of how those animals get here. So if it's through ships or planes, and these are ships and planes that are carrying animal, uh, animals or and they're using containers, uh, those containers, those ships, those planes can be contaminated. So in other words, if we have a shipment of cattle that go out of Portland, Maine, you know, they, they were sending cattle to Turkey for for a number of years. I believe they're still doing it. Turkey has lumpy skin. Those ships have to come back. And uh, if they're coming back carrying other cargo, uh, or, you know, maybe that's how we get our dogs, um, that could be the source. So I wouldn't be worried about the dogs per se. I'd be worried about uh, the how they're trans, how they are transported back to the states, and and any contamination of those transport means. Okay. And the last question we have in the chat is: If the virus needs to be inoculated, how does it get from a desiccated hide into cattle? Or if in feed, it will likely not be inoculated. So, can the virus infect the cattle through ingestion? Okay, so um, so this is one of those situations where the the primary transmission route, if you have uh, the onset of disease on a premises, is, is through uh, vectors, mechanical transmission. Um, but it can still be transmitted by contact. Uh, it's just not the primary route of transmission. And so when we talk about contact, that's going to be uh, muzzle. Uh, oral cavity, nasal cavity, things of that sort, even in breeding. Uh, so if you have an infected bull or infected semen, artificial insemination, you can inoculate an animal. Um, and so, of course, through feed, uh, if feed is contaminated, it's going to be basically an, an oral contamination, and, and that can occur readily with lumpy skin disease. Um, with the with the vectors, typically it's a situation where those vectors are picking this virus up and transmitting it mechanically. So this can be from the, an initial animal that breaks with the disease. You have the sit fast flies come in and fly strike on those lesions and then transmit to other animals on a premise. Um, but also they can pick it up from contaminated feed. In other words, flies in the feed. Uh, especially if you're using wet rations, flies in the feed, and then they're mechanically transmitting or inoculating cattle. Okay. Have you found an increase in lumpy skin disease in countries that place more restrictions on pesticide use? Oh, that I do not know. Okay. But it's a, it's a good question. But... Um, because if, if you can't control the vectors, this can be a problem. Yeah. 
Are there any other questions? We're just about nearing the end of our webinar. Um, so I will thank you again, Rich, for this very interesting talk. Um, it's a hot topic, so I really appreciate you doing this. And um, I, as I always say to everyone, um, it's, we're part of the National Training and Exercise Program. We thank you for doing it. And if you have any ideas for webinars that you think would, can, we can explore for our emergency preparedness community, please feel free to contact us. And as always, you can find recorded webinars on various topics on the TEP video gallery online at USDA APHIS website. So we've gotten a lot of comments, Rich, that, that excellent presentation. Thank you very much. Um, so it was a great talk. Okay. Thank you. So Hope thanks, everyone. everyone. All right. We'll be in touch. All right. Bye. All right. No April Fool's today. No April Fool's. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, take care.